How many of you have already been on a vacation this summer? Okay, how many of you have not gone on vacation this summer? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> how many of you don't get to go on vacation this summer? I see a few hands. Oh, we'll pray for you. Okay, <laughs> that's tough. That's a hard life. Uh, my family and I actually, uh, the week of July 4th had a vacation, but we actually did a staycation, uh, hoping that it would be more relaxing, hoping that we'd get a little more time with family and friends. So my wife's family all came in, her four siblings, spouses, uh, her mom, and a couple friends. And so we had about 14 of us for about a week at our house, her mom's house, doing things just a lot of time in our pool, a lot of time playing yard games, eating way too much food. Um, we actually had one of the friends who came and visited for a couple days. They said, man... I've never been with a family who eats so much as they enjoy time together. Um, so it was a good time. We enjoyed it a lot. But we didn't want to do too much, but we did plan one day where we'd go down to D.C. So we, we decided to go down to D.C., we, but under tons of talk with many of you who do that commute every day um, and had advised me not to make that drive, we actually just went down to Shady Grove and jumped on the metro. So we got on the metro, and we, we headed down to Union Station, Central Station, whatever they call that thing down there. Um, and then headed over to the National Mall. We did the Washington Monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the whole reflecting pool, all that. And by about 9.30, we were all drenched in sweat, soaked, totally dehydrated. Um, and so we decided to do the Smithsonian's, which was great. Our kids loved it, but we had all four of our kids there and one of our nephews so we had five kids over the course of the day that had been like 96, 97, Smithsonian's, no naps, and we only lost one of them. So <laughs> we, thought it was a, we thought it was a great day, went well. Uh, but it was around dinner time, about 5 o'clock, we decided, hey, we need to head for dinner. So we went up to DuPont Circle Market area. Uh, they have a lot of good food in that area. So we jumped back on the metro. It was about a 10-minute ride up to that area. Uh, and as we were getting on, there was about 14 of us, and we had two strollers. And five kids, and so, of course, as we're heading into the metro, we get all those looks. You don't belong here. Um, and so we're all chatting. We're having a great time. We get into the metro. You know, we're all slammed in there like sardines. But as I look around, we're with the commuters who do this every day, right? This is their commute home. And I start looking around, and I see people are shoulder to shoulder. They're eyeball to eyeball. They're armpit to armpit, standing right next to each other. And yet, what's not going on? There's no interaction, almost no interaction, and we get on, and we're loud and boisterous and having a good time and hanging out and yelling at the kids because it's late at night, and they're hungry, and they're hot. And, and everybody's looking at us like, these guys are fish out of water. What are they doing? Don't they know the protocol? We don't talk on this thing. <laughs> well, lo and behold, I'm sitting there and observing this, and I realize something clicks. I'm like, man, we live in a culture where we have so much community and connecting opportunities, and yet we all feel very lonely so often. And I know I'm part of the problem. There was part of the ride where I sat next to somebody else. I'm looking at my family on the other side, and, and I don't know that I said two words to them. And yet, then I get off, and I, real, I, I realize that there's times in my life where I feel really lonely. There's nobody I connect to. And I think that's really the, the reality of our world is that we're so overly connected, but we're famished for community, for real community. We have hundreds of ways to connect, right? Think about it. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Google, email, Messenger, text. Oh, and we still have things called phones we could pick up and call each other too. And yet, so many of us and so much of our world is consumed and actually feel this weight of loneliness and feeling like nobody understands, nobody cares, nobody knows what's going on. See, I think we live in a world where we're all seeking community, but we're in a lonely reality. And my question for us this morning is, why are we constantly desiring community, but persistently feeling lonely? And I think there's three reasons for it, and then we'll eventually see a solution. See, I think the three reasons we're lonely, even though we desire community, is one, we're designed for it. Two, we actually destroy community. And three, we can often deify community. So if you'd stand with me, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 25. Turn on your Bibles, open up your Bible, look up at the screen, and follow along as I read Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought 
and brought them to man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to the livestock and to the birds of the heaven, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. While he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman, brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Let's pray. God, we thank you that even though we live in a world that loneliness is on the rise, where there's times where we're lonely and feel alone and like nobody understands or cares, God, I thank you that you understand that and that you've given a solution and designed us in such a way to live in community. And yet, God, help us this morning as we come to your word to understand more of who you are how you call us to live, and the hope that you give us. And we pray that you be honored and glorified with it. In your name we pray. Amen. See, I think the, one of the reasons we desire community and yet feel lonely is, number one, we're designed for community. We see here, this is the story of creation. God's been creating through his word for a whole week, speaking and things coming into existence. And at the end of every day, back in chapter one, do you remember what God said? Seven times throughout chapter one as he looked on his creation and what he made. It is good. Seven times. It is good. 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 I think that was seven. But finally, we get to chapter two and God's recalling in detail kind of the creation of man and what's going on with man specifically. And he gets to verse 18. And for the first time, we see a phrase, not good. God's looked out his creation. Everything's perfect and in place, but he says, see something that's not good. What is it that's not good? What is it that caused God to look at it and say, oh, wait, this is not good? It's that man is alone, right? Adam's got nobody like him, no community. He's on his own. And it's not good that we are alone. We're not designed to be on our own. We're designed to be in community. And yet, I think the reality is our culture is plagued by loneliness. And research is repeatedly coming back and showing us this. Last year, health insurer Cigna took a nationwide survey of 20,000 adults. And here's the response. 54% of them said they feel like nobody actually knows them. Over 50% of our nation feels like nobody knows them. 56% said the people they surround themselves with are not necessarily with them. And 40% of people said they lack companionship that their relationships aren't meaningful, and they're isolated from other people. And this was on a scale of 20 to 80. The closer to 80, the more lonely the people felt. And they actually broke the, it down by generations. Generation Z, the mid, those born mid-90s to early 2000s, have an average loneliness score of 48. We go to the next generation older, my generation, from the 80s to mid-90s. The millennials have a score of 45, Generation above us, the baby boomers at 42, and the next generation at 38. What does that trend show us? Our culture is getting more and more lonely. It's not getting better. And that's a problem because loneliness affects us in multiple ways. Number one, it increases our likeliness to feel depressed. It actually causes us to have problems processing information. How many of you have difficulty making decisions at times? Check the box of, am I lonely? Because loneliness actually makes it more difficult to make decisions. Um, Those who are lonely are actually more likely to get sick. And they're increased, they're more increased, they have higher anxiety and panic attacks. Loneliness affects us in every way. And it's because we're not designed for loneliness. We're not designed to be alone. We're designed for community. And the first community God creates here in Genesis chapter 2 is marriage. Adam's all on his own. But yet he's still got the animals around, right? I mean, he's naming livestock and birds and others. And so he's not technically fully alone. There's things present with him. But he's alone, how? Relationally. There's no one like him to relate with. 
to interact with, to communicate with, to live life with. And that's where God creates man, or creates woman for man. He designs a community. He brings into existence a group of people meant to live life together and enjoy life together. See, God addresses the reality of being alone by providing a community in which to be known. Look at verse 25. It's not just that Adam and Eve are now physically present with each other. Because in verse 25, at the culmination, we see the man and his wife were both naked and were not what? Ashamed. It's not just they're together. It's that they're actually unashamed of completely who they are. They are laid bare before one another, fully knowing their hearts, their intentions, everything, and they're not ashamed of it. They're fully known and fully loved. See, community solves loneliness not simply when you're no longer alone, but when you are fully known. See, God addresses this design for community with an antidote. Because being known is the antidote to being alone. It's not just being physically present with people, it's actually being known. And it begins by recognizing that we're designed for community. And if you're anything like me, you you probably feel this from day to day. I'm in my office and I shoot emails out and I interact with people at work and I'm doing things in the office all day long and then I go home and guess what's the one thing I actually want to do? I actually still want to interact with my wife. I want to know her. I want to be known. I want to interact and be in community. Sometimes it's with my kids. I want to interact with them. And on rare occasion, I actually want to get to know and talk to my neighbors. (laughs) Rare occasion. See, it's like we have this deep longing that we know we're designed to live life with other people. So why are we still lonely? Well, I think it's because as we continue on in the story into chapter 3, we see that we quickly destroy community. Genesis 3, verse 1 through 6. We, whether you've grown up in church or this is your first time, you probably know somewhat this story. See, the serpent's more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that there was, the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. See, you've probably heard of this perfect Edenic setting before, this garden-like setting where things were perfect, community was happening, everything was in harmony. But it doesn't last for long. See, Adam and Eve took the fruit and ate of it. They discarded that which they were made for, the flourishing and the setting they were made for, and it changed the world forever. You see, in this we actually see that Our natural bent is to destroy community. It's why community is so hard to find and live in, because we naturally seek to destroy it. It's ingrained in our nature. Our hearts and our lives constantly are bent to destroy that which is good for us. Think about if you've had kids, you know this reality, that they tend to destroy that which is good for them. My wife and I put our kids to bed every night, And we have a routine of bath time, pajamas, reading, prayer, and we tuck them in. Part of that tucking in is we go to every child, each one of us individually, and we ask them, what's your favorite part of the day? So they tell us, we interact a little bit. Well, a couple couple nights ago, a couple weeks ago, my wife, I'm listening to her interaction with her youngest daughter, Kala. And she's interacting a little bit, and then she goes, okay, honey, hey, what was your favorite part of your day? And Kala looks at her and goes, nothing. (laughs) Nothing. Okay. So Bethany, being gracious, goes, no, 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 what what was your favorite part of the day, honey? She goes, no, mommy. So Bethany graciously leans over, kisses her, says she loves her, and walks away. She's walking out of the room. She pulls the door closed behind her. Literally, the latch hits. And what's the first thing we hear? Mommy, favorite part of day! (laughs) She She just destroyed the very thing she wanted. Don't we do the same thing with community sometimes? We want people to understand us and know us and and hang out and and be in relationship, and yet we run from it, or we do things to sabotage it. 
And I think there's three ways that Genesis 3 shows us we try to do that. Verse 7, this community has been totally destroyed at this point. And so the eyes of them both are open, and they knew that they were naked, and they do what? Adam and Eve sew fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. What are they doing? They're insulating themselves from other people, from one another. They're taking that which they now are ashamed of and aren't sure how the other's going to respond, and they hide it. They cover it up. They mask it. They don't let each other see the full picture anymore of their heart and their soul. And I think that's something we all fall captive to, especially if we're in leadership in any capacity, whether that's in a family or in our homes or at the workplace or in our communities. We as leaders tend to keep a little bit of a barrier and separation. And some of that's healthy, but not completely. See, Moses does the same thing in Exodus 18 in trying to keep that separation, insulating himself from others. And his father-in-law shows up, and he has this interaction with Moses. He says, the next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is it that you're doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? And all the people stand around you from morning till evening. And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God when they have a dispute. They come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And then Moses' father-in-law says to him, What you're doing is not good. You You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it what? Alone. Alone. And it's not good. That should remind us of Genesis 2. That oftentimes we try to be alone and do things on our own, and he says it's not good. Now, I'm not saying we we bear everything to everyone. That's not good either. We've all experienced that. It's not that everybody needs to know us, but does somebody know us? All of us. See, I think this is one that we're actually really good at in the church to insulate ourselves, to mask things we don't want others to know, to only say so much that we don't bear the whole truth and let people fully know us. But that's just the first way we destroy community, the first way we could destroy community. Because then Adam and Eve go on, and Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 says this, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. God calls out to him and says, where are you? He says, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden. And Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. See, the first way we do it is we just insulate ourselves. We still interact with people. We still hang out with people, but but we keep them at a distance. There's another way that we do it where we actually isolate ourselves. We totally run from community. Adam and Eve do it here. They totally run to hide. Completely get away from the relationship with God and with others. Creating more of a rift in the community. See, every one of us can fall into this trap. Anyone can. Even the greatest of kings. King David fell into this same trap. In 2 Samuel 11, we read that it was, it, it was the time, it was the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. And David does what? He sends Joab and his servants with him in all Israel. They ravage the Ammonites. They besiege Rabbah. But David does what? He remains at Jerusalem. He remains isolated and alone. And then what happens? We should know the story. But as scripture goes on to tell us, he's out on his on his rooftop. He sees a woman bathing. He finds her beautiful. He sends for her. And then David sent messengers, took her. She comes to him and he lays with her. See, David's isolation from community resulted in his immorality. When he separated himself from the very thing he was designed for, he fell. And he destroyed himself. And his kingdom. And the nation. See, community is not just something we're designed for. It's actually something we need. We naturally seek to destroy it. First off, by insulating ourselves. We wear masks. Secondly, by isolating ourselves. Sometimes we just flat out run from it. But there's a third way we see in verse 11 and 12. Genesis 3.11, God says, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And Adam answers, Well, God, um, the serpent told me I was naked. 
He actually doesn't answer the question God asked. What's he do? The Lord, verse 12. The woman you gave to be with me, Lord. What's he do? He incriminates the other person. He takes the very person God has given him to live in community, to be in relationship, to be known, to be loved, and what's he do? Chucks her under the bus. Along with actually God as well. It's her fault and it's your fault, God. See, those are the, I think those are the three basic ways we can all destroy community. Oh, it looks different for all of us. If you're an extrovert in here, you probably lean more towards the first. You love being with people. You want to interact with them. You hang out with them. But you tend to stay. There's weather. There's sports. And maybe you share about grandma's issues. And your kids, they're having a hard time at school. And there's stuff going on there. But you never really get to your heart and sharing with people what you're struggling with and what you're wrestling with. And so you insulate yourself. You're wearing a mask. You can only go so far with anybody. And then there's the introverts in the room. I mean, you have to be around people all day at work. You can't be around people at home and in your community as well. But what tends to happen is in needing that alone time and being recharged, that time grows and grows and grows to the point where maybe you're not even hanging out with anybody just to get to know and relate people. Or maybe you're the third kind of method. The person who tries to be, live in community. You try this group and then that group and then this social event and that social event. Um, and you've even tried Bible studies and groups and, and at church. But what happens is it seems like nobody just understands you. Nobody gets you and so you leave. Or somebody else does something wrong. And then in this group, somebody else did something wrong. And in that group, somebody else didn't understand you. And you start incriminating Preacher. everybody. Yeah. See, the problem is we all destroy community, every single one of us, even though we want it. And when we want it that bad and we realize we're destroying it, guess what we can do? The third reason we, can, we, we still feel lonely is because we ultimately turn to deifying community. Because we want it, because we understand we destroy it and we're still going after it so hard, we make it the ultimate thing. We make it the thing that our heart will be satisfied in. And we demand from the community around us, from the relationships around us, to fulfill every desire and need of our hearts. And Jesus recognizes this in John chapter 17. He realizes that people can pursue community as the product, as the end result, instead of a byproduct of something else. He's, been in the, he's in the upper room with his disciples. They, he's washed their feet. They've had the Passover. He's taught them about the Holy Spirit coming after his ascension. And now he's praying for them. And here's his prayer in verse 20. John 17, 20. I do not ask for these only, the disciples, but also those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given to me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know you have sent me and love them, even as you love me. Four times in three verses, Jesus says he wants them, the followers of Jesus, to be what? One. And it's a great thing. He wants them to be unified. He wants them to be a community. He wants them to be together and to love each other. But the problem is we desire and pursue community for community's sake. We demand that community be an end in and of itself. And so we ultimately end up deifying community. We make community what it's all about. That it starts to take over our hearts and our desires as the ultimate thing. That only if I had community, then I'd be whole. Then I'd be fulfilled. Then I'd be complete. And when we do that, when we deify it, when we make it the ultimate, we're actually left chasing the wind. It's like chasing our shadow. It's like chasing, it's like a cat chasing a laser pointer. See, when I was in middle school, I had an orange tabby cat. Well, my mom did. I never had a cat. But we, I grew up with this cat. It was probably about the size of the palm of my hand when we first got it when I was in middle school, early middle school. And about two or three years later, I'm probably a freshman in high school, um, we'd grown up, it's very active, it's always around, um, and it was probably the cat out of all of them we ever had that I would say I was like, that was my cat, you know, like, that was for all you cat people. I had a cat. 
But what happened was I realized as a freshman in high school, there were these cool things called laser pointers that you could do. You could point, you know, long distances and make people annoyed by them. But then I realized, oh, it really can get on my cat's nerves too. So I would sit in my living room and I'd come over the recliner on this side of the living room and our living room would go that way. And I'd call for the cat. I'd say, Chloe, here, kitty, kitty. And she'd come walking down the hallway around the entertainment center. And as soon as I saw her, I'd be holding the laser pointer in my hand and I'd point it right in the middle of the floor. And immediately she's whoosh, stealth mode, right? Like a lion in the field, ready to pounce. So I'd start moving it real slow towards me. And she'd, her eyes was coming. And then all of a sudden, I'd, I'd wiggle a little more and she'd pounce. You know that part when the cat's just like whoosh, gone? So I'd move it and she'd start running. So we'd do this for, I don't know, probably longer in my mind than it really was. But we'd, I'd take her back and forth on the living room, back and forth. And one day I'm sitting there and I realize as I'm bringing it back towards me and she's running, that on the other side of my living room there's a wall. And so I'm like, well, if I can get her over here and then I'm sitting the laser pointer that way, guess what I can probably make her do? Probably get her up this wall. So I run that laser pointer across the floor, up the wall. She jumps four or five feet in the air, knocks something off of the wall, and I get in trouble for that, but that's another story. And it comes down. But then I realize eventually, I'm, I'm just having fun with her. I wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And then, I'm, and then I get the smart idea. I'm like, you know what? Let's see what happens when she, I let her catch it. So I stop it. She gets it with her paw. Guess what happens to the laser pointer when she got her paw on it? Move to the back of her paw. So now she's freaked out. So she puts her other paw on it. Now it's on the other back of her paw. Now she's out of paws. What does she do? She bites at it. And now the laser pointer is on the back of her head. She thinks it's gone. Right? And then she turns around. She's panting, tired, exhausted, and totally not satisfied because she didn't catch what she wanted to. Why? Because she went after the red dot of the laser pointer instead of going to the source. And it's the same way for community with us. When we run after community for its own sake... We are left dissatisfied, unfulfilled, and wanting more. Because we're not going to the source where community is found and created. See, we often do this with friends and in social groups. We get in them hoping they'll be the end-all, be-all, hoping that we can find friends and find community and live life with other people, and then they let us down. And we feel unsatisfied. So we either begin to insulate ourselves, to isolate ourselves, or to incriminate others and run to find another group. And unfortunately, the reality is the same is true in the church. That when we place that expectation on other people in groups, we are always going to be left dissatisfied and unfulfilled. Because unity, community is not the end goal. Being in relationship with other people is not the end goal. It's not the ultimate satisfying endeavor of life. It's actually the result of the satisfying endeavor of life. See, community is the outcome of something greater. It's the result of believing in someone. And Jesus saw that in Genesis, or Genesis John chapter 17, verse 20. He actually tells us that. Look at verse 20. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will what? Believe in me through their word that they may be one. See, Jesus knew that beliefs changed behaviors. And so as the disciples went out and shared the good news, proclaimed the gospel to the nations, what happened was people experienced radical, life-giving, caring community. We see it in Acts chapter 2, verse 44 to 46. All who believed were together, had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. What a community experience. Look at the love and the joy they had. People had a need. They said, let me go sell my boat and let me give you some. Oh, you have a, a medical need and we need to take you. So let, let me sell something and help you out. Let's go enjoy meals together. And here's what, they don't do it begrudgingly, but look at the end, with glad and generous hearts. They want to do this. But why did people enjoy this friendship and care? Were there just a bunch of lonely people in Jerusalem going, hey, you want a community? You want community? Let's do this thing, yeah. No. Verse 44 gives us a hint, and all who believed. See, they demonstrated a community as a byproduct of their belief in Christ. 
And if you go all the way back to, to verse 38, Peter had been explaining the gospel that there's this Messiah who had come to save his people from their sins that Israel had been waiting for years. And Peter, and so they say, man, we're cut to the heart. We understand our sin. For What must we do? And Peter simply says, repent, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. What's he saying? He's saying, recognize that your wages of your sin is death. That there's something in you that you cannot fix yourself. And nobody outside of you can fix yourself in community. But there's a free gift of God that's eternal life in Christ Jesus. That he's the one that will satisfy. He's the one that will fulfill that. And see, the people in Acts 2 experienced community. Not because they were seeking community, but because they were seeking Christ. A pastor in Germany in the mid-1900s named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, put it this way. Christianity means community through Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. No Christian community is more or less than this. Whether it is a brief single encounter or daily fellowship of years, Christian community is only this. We belong to one another only through and in Jesus Christ. What he's saying is community is not the goal. The goal and the prize is Christ. Because what he's doing is through Christ, we're actually invited into the community that has been in his existence for all of time. That the Father, Son, and Spirit have been in deep relationship and community from all time, of all eternity. And that's the ultimate community. That's what our hearts are meant for. That's community as it should be. And yet, we still seek community and live in a lonely reality. We ride on metros or trains or planes, wanting to connect with people and interact with people, yet sit silently and un unfulfilled and lonely. We have more devices to connect and build community, and yet still we find ourselves lonely. See, the desire for community is a good thing. We're designed for it, yet we destroy it, and oftentimes we can make it the ultimate. But what all of that is meant to do is point us to the source of community. Point us to the one in whom our heart is meant to rest and find satisfaction and fulfillment in alone. See, the greatest community ever is we can know and be known where we can be fully known and relate and commune with one is in Jesus Christ. The one who knows us fully, completely, every dark spot. And yet, loved us so much that he came for us and died in our place. And simply by repenting of our sins, seeking forgiveness, and following him as Lord and Savior of our life, we enter into not just community with him, but here's the, here's the cool part. We actually get an entire family. Amen. That there's others who have already and are believing the same thing, morphing and becoming and transforming more into the image of Jesus, the one we're all fixing our eyes on. And that's where community happens. See, for those of us who are lonely and want to see community, we need to look first at Christ. Those of us who already know him, we have the answer. For those who are lonely around us, we have the answer. But why is it that community and even being in community can so much take place of being in relationship with God? Here's why. As the worship team comes up, I want to tell you the story of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In 1945, Hitler's in control of Germany, we're in Flossenburg, Germany, and we're in a concentration camp. It's a gray day in April, and it's time for Dietrich Bonhoeffer's execution. He had been um, condemned and was commanded to be executed. The, the charge was given by Heinrich, Henrik Himmler, excuse me, Hitler's executioner. Bonhoeffer's been in prison for two years. He's traveled from place to place to place to place, totally excommunicated from family, from friends, from any kind of church, in any kind of community. He's been in Tegel, Berlin, Buchenwald, Schoensburg, and now Flossenburg, losing contact with everyone in his life. And earlier in his life, prior to his execution, he wrote a book prior to his imprisonment called Life Together. And in that, he's reflecting on the idea, this idea of community and the richness of it and the joy of it. And here's what he says. The physical presence of others is a source of incomparable joy and strength. And you say, why? 
because it's a physical sign of the presence of the triune God. Because when we look and we desire to be in community, it's showing us who our God is. That he's a God that lives in community and wants community with us and friendship and fellowship with us. And so if you're here this morning and you're in that lonely spot and you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ and you've, you've gone from friends to friends to group to group and you're unsatisfied, unfulfilled, it's because your heart's meant to be in the one who made you to be in relationship with him. And all you have to do is come to him, confess and repent of your sin, believe in him. But the joy is we get to be in community with others too. And there's some of you in here who may be saying, yeah, I've trusted in Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus, but man, I'm still lonely. My question would be, are you living in community? Have you found a community and a, of people that can, can live life with you? We wanna help you do that. There's home groups and Bible studies and all kinds of other groups that we offer so people can find community and ultimately so that we can remind each other weekly and daily that our hearts are not meant to find the ultimate satisfaction in each other. And believer, the one who maybe isn't feeling lonely this morning, the one who has community, we live in a world dominated by loneliness, dominated by people who want to connect. The question is, we have the answer Will we share it? Will we point people to, to the one in whom their soul's satisfaction is meant for and designed for? And be a friend that points them to the ultimate community found in God. Let's pray. God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you love us even when we are unlovable and deserve none of it. Thank you that you've designed us in such a way to reflect that you've been in community all your life all the existence of the world and before. And you've designed us to be in community, and yet God, forgive us of how we destroy it. Lord, there's ones here who are lonely, who have never placed their faith and trust in you and, and are finding dissatisfaction all over the world in groups they get in and friendships and relationships. Lord, I pray that today, this morning, they would, they would see Christ as the ultimate satisfaction of that, that he's the one who will never leave them or forsake them. God, for those of us who know you, I pray that you would help us share that with others. You would help us be that to others as well, that we would be, allow people to be fully known and transparent and authentic and love them as you've loved us, offering them forgiveness as you've forgiven us and calling them to find their ultimate satisfaction and joy in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray.